Thank you. Welcome everybody to the Denver Regional Council of Governments board work session for Wednesday, August 4th, 2021, my wedding anniversary. So we're going out to dinner right after this. Uh, I wanna call the meeting to order. We don't need to take roll. Uh, we have it, if needed, we have it on the, uh, on the virtual platform. Uh, the second item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, we would request that there be no comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held uh, before the board. I would ask folks in the attendees list if they are a member of the public, if they would like to offer public comment to the board. And I'll give that about 10 seconds for people to hit the raise hand function. I don't see anybody attending on the telephone. I see one, two, three. Okay, uh, Melinda, do you uh, uh, promote them in the order that they've uh, raised their hands? Uh, actually, if you would like to call on them, I'll uh, allow sure. them to speak and then oh, we'll- get okay, I see. All right, uh, Ian Tafoya, go ahead. Three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello, Councilman Flynn. Uh, congratulations on your anniversary. I hope you have a good time. Uh, my name is Thomas Tafoya. I'm the Colorado State Director for Green Latinos. Councilman Flynn actually happens to be my council member. I'm from Denver, Colorado. I'm here today making comments about the Greenhouse Gas Roadmap and encouraging you all to do everything in your power to follow the plans, the regional plans, Metro Vision, and also your municipal plans and doing everything you can to improve the lives of individuals in your community by cleaning the air, reducing our risk for climate impact and equally applying the law for people to have access to clean air and clean water. You know, there's a big uh, decisions that are gonna be up here in front of you. And I wanna encourage you to be as bold as you can. Post COVID, we know that PM 2.5, which is directly related to transportation emissions is something that greatly impacted and changed communities for the worst through COVID. I also know that we need greater regional participation between RTD and Dr. Cog. I know that sometimes easy to pass the buck between agencies, but this is the moment we need everyone to come to the table to access these once in a lifetime dollars and to do the right thing. Now, when it comes to Metro Vision, transportation systems that are safe is one that is important here. Safe for whom? It's not just about Vision Zero, but it's also about the tailpipe emissions that are impacting people. You know, trading the safety of others in uh, suburban areas for those in dense population hotspots is not acceptable anymore for green Latinos or our partners. I believe that we can all come to the table make good decisions here. Uh, and I, I just, again, want to offer to be available to everyone to help bridge the gap between Latino and frontline communities and these great, these huge decisions that we're on the cusp of making. If you're not aware, SB 260, the largest transportation bill in state history, we were instrumental in leading a coalition to create the first environmental justice office within this agency, among many other wins for frontline communities. I'm here to work with you. Let's solve our problems. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. Uh, Melinda, next I have Matt Fromer. Matt, uh, as soon as you uh, get the high sign, go ahead. Three minutes. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, Councilman Flynn and other members of the Dr. Cog board. My name is Matt Fromer. I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. Today, I'd like to comment on the upcoming greenhouse gas planning rule at CDOT to create GHG budgets for transportation plans. As you know, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas pollution in Colorado, and we have aggressive statutory climate targets to cut transportation emissions 25% by 2025 and 40% by 2030. Unlike other high polluting sectors like electricity, transportation pollution is increasing as people buy more SUVs and trucks, drive further distances, and our state population grows, particularly in more car centric areas. 2025 and 2030 are right around the corner and how we choose to spend our $2.5 billion in annual transportation budget has a significant impact on travel behavior and subsequently the amount of pollution our system generates. We need to build the infrastructure and service that gives people convenient, affordable, safe and equitable access to clean transportation options. Senate Bill 260 will generate a significant amount of new revenue to build transportation infrastructure and how we spend those billions determines whether or not whether or not we achieve our climate targets. 
Um, greenhouse gas pollution has already warmed the planet by about one degree Celsius, a little bit more. And it's creating warmer and drier conditions that increase risks of wildfire and flooding, the consequences of which we're now experiencing on the I-70 corridor in Glenwood Canyon, where multi-week closures are expected and will have significant impacts on our state economy. We need to act now and we cannot afford to delay taking action. The, the greenhouse gas planning rule was identif identified in the greenhouse gas roadmap as an important strategy re to reduce VMT. The roadmap's transportation modeling depicts a heavy reliance on vehicle electrification to decarbonize transportation. But the modeling also shows that even in a highly optimistic electric vehicle adoption scenario, where we grow from about 38,000 EVs today to about 1 million EVs by 2030, and we also increase the share of zero emission trucks to 40% market share by 2030, we'll still only get about three quarters of the way to our 2030 transportation greenhouse gas reduction targets. The vehicle fleet turnover just won't happen fast enough to hit our 2025 and 2030 targets, which not only put us on a glide path toward near zero emissions by 2050, but they also minimize cumulative emissions over time, which is our real carbon budget. We absolutely need to electrify the transportation sector, but we also need complementary policies to reduce vehicle miles tra traveled by directing investments toward multimodal projects and smart land use policies instead of traditional highway expansions. This, this greenhouse gas planning rule is our best opportunity to do that. Designing and implementing this policy will require collaboration from every agency and organization in the transportation space. Something we're frankly not very good at right now. Um, we need to bring Dr. Cog, CDOT, other MPOs, local governments, transit agencies, communities, and the private sector together to create a clean and connected multimodal transportation system. And much Matt, of this will hinge on Dr. Yes. Matt, uh, the three minutes has passed, but I would like to have the rest of your okay. statement. It sounds like it was prepared. And actually, uh, Ian, also, would it be possible for you after this to email those to uh, uh, to Dr. Cog? Doug, what would be a good email address? And frankly, that would that would make it uh, more of a written record that uh, that we could look back on, because I don't think many people are going to watch this recording again. And I'd like to have the advantage of them. Doug, who could they email them to? Yeah, they, we have a general email address that they, they're more than happy to send those to. Um, I think it's on our website, but Melinda, what is that website? What is the email address? Is it? Uh, it's literally drcog at drcog.org, but they could That's also send it to me, which is, uh, you can see mstevens at drcog.org, and I'll make sure that they get to the right people. Okay, uh, Matt, yeah, because I, I would like to have the rest of the statement, but I want to respect the time uh, for the speakers, and I think it's actually better to have it in writing. Uh, okay. So that, thank, sorry, thank you very much. Stevens M. Stevens at drcog.org. With a, with a V. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next all. up. Oh, you're welcome. Next up is uh, Becky English. Becky, go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting us, uh, the public, into this meeting. Uh, I'm Becky English with the Sierra Club. I, I chair our transportation committee for Colorado. We have uh, over 100,000 members in Colorado who are Sierra Club members. And I, I just want to uh, have this opportunity to ask you uh, just a few years after I first spoke with Dr. Cog about uh, the Central 70 project, uh, it's, it's obviously very clear that Colorado is obviously suffering direct climate change consequences that are already very costly, environmentally harmful, and sometimes deadly. Uh, greenhouse gas concentrations are the cause, and transportation is our most guilty sector. Today, nearly a full month into our ongoing latest ozone alert, I ask again that you recognize and act on our obligation to clean up our air. As our largest and most powerful MPO, Dr. Cog can provide the leadership necessary for the current transportation rulemaking to be big enough, to be precise, to be accountable, and to be highly effective. I'm asking you to engage in the rulemaking with the commitment and passion necessary to achieve the objectives we must if our atmosphere has any prayer of healing itself and sustaining the wonderful and precious diversity of life <clears throat> we appreciate so much in our beautiful state. Colorado residents deserve nothing less, so we hope we can count on you. Thank you again. 
Thank you, Becky. Likewise, if that was a prepared statement, would you mind emailing it to mstevens at drcog.org? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks. Excellent. I have a, a, a an attendee with a hand raised that doesn't have a name. It says Conservation Colorado Meeting. Uh, if you would like to speak, go ahead, but, but please tell us who you are. I'm so sorry about that. Um, my name is Jenny Gang, and you'll be shocked to learn that I work for Conservation Colorado. Um, I am the transportation advocate, um, and I am a resident here in North Denver. Um, like the others, I'm providing comment today to ask you to work with CDOT on an equitable, enforceable, and verifiable greenhouse gas pollution standard rulemaking at the Transportation Commission. Every year, we grow more familiar with the impacts of climate change. I have friends and family back east that call it an existential crisis, but for us, the crisis is here. It's a violent threat to our way of life. We've seen it in the recent heat waves. I spent an entire day driving from Commerce City to Littleton looking for a Home Depot that had swamp coolers in stock. Uh, we've seen it in the disastrous mudslides that trapped people overnight on I-70 last week. Uh, and we've seen it in the thick wildfire smoke that has traveled all the way from California and Oregon, obscuring our skyline and our beloved mountains. And we've seen it in the faces of children when they're told they can't go outside today or tomorrow or the next day. It couldn't be more clear that there is no time to lose. Even after the progress made in the 2021 legislative session, Colorado is still not on track to meet our targets to reduce climate pollution. This rulemaking is paramount to the goals required by HB 1261 and spelled out in the Polis administration's greenhouse gas roadmap. The roadmap sets an unequivocal goal of 10% BMT reduction by 2030, and we hope to see long-term multimodal solutions be given priority over projects that eventually increase BMT, such as highway expansions. Transportation planning is a daunting and technical endeavor, but at the end of the day, it's about selecting projects that serve the people of the Dr. Cog region when it comes to climate options and environmental justice. Your constituencies are home to some of the most pollution burdened communities in Colorado which are predominantly low income and populated by Latino, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. The greenhouse gas pollution standard has the potential to rectify generations of environmental racism and transportation planning by modeling impacts and reducing both greenhouse gases and the co-pollutants that are devastating your constituents' health. As the rulemaking moves through the Transportation Commission, I ask all of you to fight for this and for robust community engagement, access to reliable and affordable public transit in every neighborhood, and careful land use strategies to maintain affordable housing and re resist displacement. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment and have a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much. And uh, also, likewise, uh, send that uh, to mstevens at drcog.org. Uh, it'll give us a written record that's much easier to refer to during our discussions than relying on this recording for your input. I appreciate that. Is anyone else in the attendees uh, desiring to offer public comment to the board? I'll give it another about five seconds. All right. Seeing no one, I want to move on to the next item, uh, which is the uh, approval of the summary of our last uh, work session, which was in May. Uh, of uh, this year. And uh, I don't believe we need a motion to approve those, do we, Doug? That's just a summary. If anybody has any corrections, uh, I'd be willing to listen right now. And if not, we'll move on to, an, uh, to our first uh, discussion item, which uh, appropriately follows this, uh, the comments from the four members of the public. So uh, Ron uh, Papsdorf, I believe you're going to uh, talk to us about uh, the greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, members of the Board of Directors. Um, I'm Ron Pepstor from the Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Uh, give me one second while I get this presentation loaded up. Okay, we should be in business. Um, thanks for thanks for the time um, this afternoon. Um, kind of so this is a conversation about the greenhouse gas transportation planning rulemaking, which is which is um, underway and has been under discussion for for actually quite some time, as alluded to by a number of the speakers um, to you this afternoon. Um, my my goals for today are to sort of give you all some some solid background for kind of how we got to the point we are in now, and tee up some issues for some further conversations with the board. 
um, at, at future meetings as we continue to engage with CDOT and other stakeholders around the development of greenhouse gas transportation planning uh, rules. Um, so that's what that's what I want to accomplish today. Hopefully I'll, I'll do that and I'll rely on feedback from you all to, to hold me accountable for making sure that I do that. Um, first, I, I also want to acknowledge uh, Rebecca White, who's um, on, on the board and at the at the meeting this evening and um, the work with Rebecca and the other CDOT staff on this. We've we've been engaged um, in discussions around sort of this rulemaking for several months now and, and talking through this. And as a matter of fact, um, Dr. Cog has had goals uh, in Metrovision and, and reflected in our regional transportation plans around reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, from surface transportation for a long time, predating the states um, kind of wading into this issue. Um, and so we, we definitely are committed to, to this and we want this rule to be successful Six, um, implementable um, and, and feasible for us um, as, as an agency and representing all of you, our local government members of Dr. Cog um, and partners and, and leaders in the transportation planning sphere uh, in the region and the state. So that's, that's our commitment to you. And, and again, we just want to tee up kind of that background and issues for further conversation as the process continues. So uh, by way of some quick background, um, Back in 2019, the legislature adopted House Bill 1261 uh, with a goal of reducing greenhouse gas pollution uh, from all sectors um, and uh, establishing statewide greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals for the state. Um, as, a, uh, that, uh, as, a, as a result of House Bill 1261, the state did develop the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap that was um, signed by the governor back in January of this year, uh, so not quite a year ago, that establishes that a pathway to meeting those climate targets uh, and, and those greenhouse gas emission reduction targets um, in the roadmap through a number of different strategies that were laid out, potential strategies. Some are being implemented, some are, are future strategies, but it did lay out uh, potential pathways for achieving th those reductions, um, ac again, across all sectors. Um, this year, uh, the legislature, um, as part of uh, Senate Bill 260, in addition to adopting new transportation funding uh, through fees and other measures and setting that whole structure, also included new requirements for CDOT guidelines and procedures um, for both CDOT and the state's five MPOs, including Dr. Cog, related to transportation planning and the implementation of regionally significant transportation projects. Um, so I want to get into a little bit of detail. I don't want to read all the words on this screen. They were included in your in your packet. Um, but uh, to kind of hit some of the highlights from two, two specific sections of Senate Bill 260 related to this issue. So Section 30 uh, kind of really called on CDOT and the Transportation Commission to implement procedures and guidelines. Um, and and that would require CDOT and the MPOs to take additional steps around regionally significant transportation capacity projects um, and to account for their impacts on statewide greenhouse gas pollution. The guidelines um, have to apply to the adoption of, the, of CDOT's next 10-year plan. You've heard about the 10-year plan before um, and um, subsequent planning cycles um, so that we evaluate the potential environmental and health impacts, um, particularly on disproportionately impacted communities as part of that work. And then there were other requirements specific to CDOT for environmental study for when they actually are implementing a regionally significant project uh, as, part of their, as part of their review and development process, as well as additional public engagement um, processes around those projects. Um, the minimum requirements uh, laid out in, in Senate Bill 260, now in statute, around um, those, those uh, rules uh, those regulations um, is to actually implement relevant rules and regulations issued by the AQCC um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions related to surface transportation to help achieve the statewide um, pollution reduction targets for greenhouse gases, um, to modify our documents and um, to ensure that there is 
the same level of analysis done for greenhouse gas pollutants as for other air pollutants. So, you know, you're familiar with the work that we do under federal air quality standards around precursors to ozone and other air, air pollutants. Uh, this, the law now requires us to do that same level of scrutiny for greenhouse gas pollutants. Um, consider things like induced demand resulting from regionally significant projects, and then consider the role of land use um, in our transportation planning processes um, and develop strategies to encourage more efficient land use decisions that reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. So those are some specific minimum requirements that are laid out in Senate Bill 260 for the policies, the procedures, the guidelines that CDOT will, will adopt under Senate Bill 260. There's another section, Section 51 in, in Senate Bill 260 that relates specifically to CDOT, Dr. Cog, and the North Front Range MPO. So the two MPOs that are, that are currently in non-attainment for federal ozone standards, um, that um, by October 1 of next year, um, CDOT has to have adopted those guidelines procedures that were referenced in section 30. Um, and Dr. Cog and North Front Range have to update our regional transportation plans to comply with those guidelines and procedures, um, again, by October 1st, 2020. Um, or there are, will be restrictions on the expenditure of a certain portions of the multimodal options fund revenues that are raised in Senate Bill 260 and allocated to the, our two MPOs. Um, and the limitation would be that we could only spend uh, that portion of those multimodal options fund revenues on projects that would help us bring the regional transportation plan into compliance with the requirements of, of Senate Bill 30, so, or Section 30 of Senate Bill 260. So there's a little bit of a, um, a nudge, a stick, to make sure that we actually implement the rules and, and um, modify, uh, update our plans to comply with those rules that are adopted by um, CDOT. So as I mentioned early on, we've been engaged in discussions with CDOT and, and many other stakeholders for many months now, um, working towards this um, rulemaking uh, that, would, that originally was gonna result from um, uh, House Bill 1261 and the roadmap regardless of Senate Bill 260, but now kind of with the new layer of, of Senate Bill 260 requirements as well, more specifics. Um, and some of the issues that we're thinking about and sort of having conversations around in our efforts to make sure that the rule can be implemented, that it is successful, that it's technically feasible for us to comply with, um, with the tools that we have available um, are sort of the stages of the planning process at which the rule would apply. So there's a discussion about, should it apply to the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program, when we adopt a TIP, when we amend the TIP, when we're selecting projects for the TIP, and, and how, or and or should it apply to the Regional Transportation Plan when we adopt and update and amend the Regional Transportation Plan. So that's, that's one area of discussion uh, that we're watching and having conversations about. And um, there's, there's no, perfect answer there. It's just has different ramifications for our work and how and how we could apply uh, the rule and how the rule might be structured. Um, the, the second issue that we've that we've been watching and, and um, giving some serious thought to are the specific targets for the Dr. Cog transportation planning process. So there's the Senate bill or House Bill 1261 and the roadmap are set statewide targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So how do we take a statewide target and come up with then sub-regional, kind of the regional components of that statewide target? What should Dr. Cog's share of that target be? And then how would, how would, you know, how would the process be to both set up our regional target within the statewide context? And again, how we would show um, uh, uh, successful compliance um, and progress towards meeting those targets. The third issue that's uh, sort of top of mind for us is sort of the scale and effectiveness of vehicle miles traveled VMT reduction strategies. Um, we look at our system and there are and there are different things we can do to affect vehicle miles traveled VMT as a system. 
The transportation investments we make are very important for lots of reasons, including managing VMT and our, you know, our, our, our regional targets through MetroVision um, are aimed at managing and reducing VMT per capita over time. Um, we, we know our economy, our region is growing um, and has been growing very rapidly. And um, our, our goals are set around reducing VMT per capita over time so that um, people, individual people are driving less, but also acknowledging that VMT, just by virtue of the economy growing, is going to tend to grow. And so what sort of strategies are available to us that are within our authority, within our jurisdiction, to be able to affect? And if you'll, if you, many of you recall, as we were developing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, we actually tested lots of different scenarios to try to establish sort of what kind of strategies would have what sorts of potential impacts or outcomes. And we know that there are transportation investments that affect VMT uh, to some level, but we got the most bang for the buck and, and the most impact on VMT through, through land use strategies for which Dr. Cog does not have authority. And the very much is vested in local jurisdictions authority. And so how we sort of deal with those issues and how that relates to the rule are things that we're, uh, we're considering very strongly and thinking through in terms of the context of putting this rule together. Again, so that we can be successful and the rule can be successful. And then really, and then the last one I'll, I'll highlight for now is sort of sort of what's, 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 the, what's the proper sort of compliance enforcement? What, what makes sense? In terms of if if we if we are unable to meet a target um, through our through our transportation planning process for whatever reason, um, what what's the what's the appropriate enforcement process? Um, and so th those discussions are are important to consider and, and things that we're having conversations again with CDOT and um, the other stakeholders involved in the conversations. Um, uh, this. I will note that the schedule that was included in the agenda packet was updated um, by CDOT after the packet went out. So I've, um, we've 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 posted this updated schedule um, on the um, on our on our Dr. Cog website on the on the board work session website, and I've included it here. Um, and and the only change. So first, let me let me go over the schedule. Um, um, the Transportation Commission authorized CDOT staff to initiate the rulemaking process um, at their meeting on July 15th. Um, right now, CDOT staff is expecting that on August 13th, they will do the official notice of rulemaking. Um, and that's when they file the, the rulemaking with the Secretary of State. And that begins sort of the official, the really formal rulemaking um, process. Um, as part of the commission's action to authorize rulemaking, the commission asked CDOT staff to hold multiple public hearings around the state, um, uh, rather than just one public hearing, which would sort of be typical for most um, state rulemakings at state agencies. Um, and the commission, I think, would, uh, was, was pretty adamant that they wanted multiple um, opportunities for those hearings. Um, during that during that process, and this schedule indicates that um, CDOT would at this point would expect to kind of start those hearings on or after September 14th of this year. Um, again, virtual, in person, held in multiple locations around the state, sometime in the second half of September. Um, from August 13th um, until October 12th would be a formal 60-day written comment period. Um, at which point all stakeholders, any interested party, could make comment on the proposed rule as it's issued on August 13th. And then this schedule uh, anticipates a Transportation Commission adoption of the rule at their meeting on November 18th. And if this schedule holds, then that rule would, be a, would become effective on January 14th of 2022. Um, so that's sort of the schedule we're operating in. Um, and then I did want to then hit some next steps for further conversations with all of you as this rulemaking process proceeds. Um, so we're here today, again, for background, kind of tee up some issues for further conversation. We included a lot of background information in the agenda packet for you uh, this evening, and we certainly would encourage you uh, as you have time to read through uh, those materials. There's some, some really good background information. Uh, some a white paper that's been developed by CDOT staff that lays out some issues, some, some staff memos uh, to the commission from 
uh, from CDOT as well as a presentation that CDOT's provided to, to the commission. I think that's that'll be really helpful background. Our intent is then to come back at your August 18th board meeting, um, at which point, at this point, we expect that CDOT will have issued um, the proposed, the formally issued the, the proposed rule on August 13th. So we would attempt to sort of review that proposed rule, at least initially with the board at that meeting. Um, the um, August 27th uh, board workshop on Friday, there's a mini session around greenhouse gas emissions, um, greenhouse gas laws, rules, and Dr. Cog. So kind of, again, another opportunity to sort of have a primer around these issues. So um, you all have a good solid base um, on which to sort of form opinions and, and direct us on how to, how to engage in the rulemaking, respond to the rulemaking. Um, at the on Saturday, the August 28th board workshop, we also are going to have a greenhouse gas mitigation kind of peer review discussion with other MPOs from around the country that have already been dealing with some of these issues. Again, further context. Um, and then finally, on September 1st at the board work session, there's we have a question here about whether we should anticipate perhaps having uh, seeking board direction uh, uh, on a position on the proposed rule that would come out on August 13th. That was our initial question. I think based on CDOT's new schedule, um, there may be an opportunity to defer that decision, that direction, that formal direction to the September regular board meeting um, on September 15th. Um, again, going back to the schedule, um, which now has the formal written comment period going through October 12th. So that does give us some, some schedule leeway. We may, not, we may not need to rush you to sort of formal direction and position on the rule um, as early as the September board work session. We probably can kind of hold that off until uh, perhaps the September regular board meeting. Again, giving us more opportunity to sort of have con further conversations with the board. Um, with that, um, maybe it, at the at the chair's pleasure, um, I certainly would be happy to invite Rebecca to make any comments from CDOT's perspective on this. Um, virtually, kick me under the table or correct the record if I misstated anything. Uh, give a little bit of a CDOT perspective, and then um, certainly entertain any questions or comments from the board. Thank you. I see raised hand, but I don't see kick under the table on the Zoom. <laughs> maybe that's something we could suggest to the web developer. Uh, uh, Rebecca, would you like to, uh, I saw that uh, you want your mem a memo that you co-authored, the white paper, is included in the pack, and I just want to remind all the directors that this is a real tight turnaround, uh, the, uh, with the uh, proposed rule being available on, on the 13th of August, that's a Friday, that our board meeting is only five days after that, so I would like to ask uh, the directors if you could ask uh, or give your staffs a head up, heads up and uh, try to get direction so we can have a productive uh, discussion on this at the board meeting on, on August 18th. And then uh, our, of course, our September board meeting occurs one day after September 14th when the uh, review period begins. So uh, having said that, uh, let's try to hit the right ground running and uh, Rebecca, uh, uh, see if you wanna, do you wanna kick Ron or do you wanna add to what he said? <laughs> We'd all like to kick Ron every once in a while. <laughs> Go ahead. No, that was actually um, a very, very nice summary of the, the work we've done to date and the intent of the rule. And I appreciate it. And I, I do want to want to say a few things. I don't know if I am um, could have the opportunity to, to share a slide or two because I wanted to give some perspective that's best showed in a, unfortunately, in a PowerPoint. Um, but until I see that I, I have that ability, let me just sort of add to what Ron said that um, I want to acknowledge and thank the Dr. Cog staff. Um, they really have been at the table with us hours and hours um, at a time. In fact, we've met every single day this week, met multiple times last week. Um, and I, I can tell you the CDOT team that is drafting this is relying a lot on the expertise that is provided by your team. Um, I, in many ways, uh, Dr. Cog um, is probably the, the best of the, the modeling crew you've been implementing conformity for a long time. So the expertise has just been invaluable. Um, I also just wanna echo Ron's statement that we all want to see a rule that is successful, implementable and feasible. 
uh, CDOT is in the interesting situation of writing a rule that we will be subject to. Um, and so we have that same objective because we are right there with the MPOs and having to follow through on this. Um, so I couldn't agree more on those principles. Um, looks like I have the ability to share my screen. Um, so the, the other, oh, good heavens. Um, That's never the good. other perspective, let me just, I'm not sure how to do this, to be honest. Um, the other perspective I just wanted to share is there was, you know, there was some discussion at the board workshop um, last last month, the full board on um, on whether this um, rule would be meaningful enough. And so I wanted to provide some greater context on um, what this rule could mean in terms of um, the overall objective we have. And let me ask, can you all see that now? Yes. Okay. So just to step back a bit, um, as, can as Ron- do, can, can you go to full screen on that? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> it's a little tough to read on a, on a laptop. Is this, in, is this in the packet? It is not. I'm happy to provide it. Ron, and I think, sort of um, opened up the informal opportunity for me to chime in a bit. So I will certainly share these slides. Thank you. Go ahead. OK. Is this a better screen now? Very much. OK. So just to back up, um, Ron had mentioned the Greenhouse Gas Roadmap is what sort of set, a, set us out on um, this path after the passage of House Bill 1261. And within the roadmap, uh, they take those overall uh, greenhouse gas reduction numbers that are set in House Bill 1261 and sort of break them down by sector. And when you look, um, when they when they took a, an in-depth look at transportation and in specific, the, the amount of reductions we wanna see in 2030, um, the number is 12.7 million metric tons. So I think that's just good context for the number I think that the chair um, Stoltzman shared last week of sort of the outer end of what we're looking at for this rule. So to break that down further, we're already on a, sort of a glide path to, to reduce about 6 million metric tons just by the nature of the EPA vehicle standards and the turnover of the fleet. Um, so EPA had proposed standards quite a while ago to set greenhouse gas requirements for vehicles you're seeing that in the more efficient vehicles that are coming into the fleet. And that's gonna get us a long way there. It's projected we would achieve about another 2 million metric tons um, from the, the move towards electric vehicles specific to Colorado. So the LEV and ZEV rule that the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment put forward that CDOT participated in, and most specifically the, the governor's goal to reach 940,000 electric vehicles by 2030, that would get us about another 2 million metric tons. So what does that leave? That leaves about 4.7 million metric tons of that kind of pie from transportation to address by 2030. And the rulemaking you've heard about today is one of what's listed here about uh, six strategies that we've identified that can, that can get after that. There is no way that the greenhouse gas standards for transportation planning gets the majority of 4.7. It's just not feasible, but it is an important part. The other pieces here that are from the roadmap deal with land use, uh, addressing trucking, getting uh, greater electrification and cleaner trucks into our Colorado fleets, um, more work on vehicle standards, uh, the concept of setting an indirect source rule which sort of looks at large um, sort of malls and other facilities that attract a lot of traffic. And then all the efforts that we're participating in to expand transit, including even you know, setting the stage for front range rail. So because each of these is in their own stage, we don't know right now the exact amount of reductions that each of these policies will get because as each one gets developed, that number would come forward but we're sort of first out of the gate. And, and the number I think was, was shared um, last month that could be the potential high end of what we might be able to achieve with a rulemaking like this would be possibly 1.7 million metric tons. 
And because, you know, from even, even though I've spent months working on this, that just really is just a number to me as well. So I just pulled just from an internet search because there's an EPA calculator out there to sort of translate what that amount of tons means in terms of our system. And it's not insignificant. So that the, that overall tonnage is about 25% of that 6 million metric ton reduction. Um, it's equivalent to taking about 300,000 passenger cars off the road for a year, 3.7 billion vehicle miles traveled, um, and removing a lot of gasoline burning. So it's, it is a big deal. Um, it is a meaningful deal. And I think it, um, we'll see where this sort of rulemaking and the draft ends up. But I just wanted to make the point that this type of work makes a difference for our goals. Um, just to add on the outreach that Ron mentioned, um, in addition to the work with Dr. Cog, we have been over the last eight months working with a greenhouse gas advisory group that has stakeholders from across the state. We've reached about 800 people through regional meetings and listening sessions. We're, we're on meeting with all sorts of stakeholders on a very regular basis. There's the white paper, and then we've just been doing a lot of an analytical work in the background um, to try to get our arms around what this rule could achieve. Um, I think I will I will end it there. You've already seen um, this deck, and um, right. okay. we'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak a little bit. Certainly, uh, let me let me kick off with a question since I have no hands up right now. But explain again uh, the the proposed rule will account for 1.7 metric uh, million metric million metric tons uh, out of the 4.7 that we still have to reduce. And what's the outlook for those other uh, 3 million? Um, and, and Chair, good question. That's what I mentioned earlier. Each of these policies is in either a very nascent stage or in an analysis. So we don't, I can't tell you right now for each of the strategies in the table, what each might achieve. I think we all know the ultimate goal. Um, and But then the real objective, like, like Ron mentioned, was is it achievable? Is it implementable? What will the technology bring us? What can we do? And so that, and that should be the basis of, of how we develop rulemakings like this. Thank you. All right, uh, let me go to the directors. And I apologize, uh, uh, Director White, uh, for calling you by your first name, breaking protocol. Uh, Director Dale, go ahead. Thank you. This is both for Ron and for um, Director White. I'll be, I'll be real formal there, but it's good to see you both. Uh, I got enough. one question is, are, who all is involved in reviewing the modeling for the decisions we make? I mean, is that it's a combination of CDOT and Dr. Cog staffs, and they look at the details of each little piece of this black box before and how we can make things happen? That's my first question. Um, Director Dale, thank you for the question. I'll, 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 um, thankfully, I've got super smart people um, that work in transportation planning and operations um, much smarter than, than I am. Um, but to answer your question uh, that are responsible for our travel demand model on which um, kind of our, our outputs are, are um, evaluated. Um, we have for our federal air quality conformity requirements, we have um, an interagency consultation group that, that meets and we, we coordinate with all of our partners to review model assumptions and uh, that go into our, our federal air quality conformity determinations and, and that modeling work. And it's a, it's a real partnership uh, between us and CDOT and RTD and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and the Environmental Protection Agency and Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration all working together to review our model assumptions and and um, and do that work in relation to conform the air quality conformity determination for a federal standpoint. Our discussions with CDOT around this rulemaking, um, we certainly have raised the issue of we think some sort of consultation process like that will be an important component of this, um, so that we have the same sort of cooperative approach to. Um, what our model assumptions will be and, and how we'll approach that from the from a from a greenhouse gas emissions um, standpoint. 
So <clears throat> a follow on to that for both of you would be, it, it's simplistic to me, but we, we uh, through the TIP process and subregions, many times we're looking at interchanges so that we'll re completely reduce a lot of idling vehicles. Is, is that something that, that's taken into consideration as we do this? Uh, I mean, that's part of the model. Our, our travel model very much looks at the entirety of the transportation system along with um, projections mm -hmm. of population and employment growth and other and other changes uh, that affect transportation uh, behavior around the region. We have a, we have a very sophisticated travel demand model, um, almost state of the art, um, really, um, that, that, that is, that's really good. It's validated, it's, it's uh, refined um, often to make sure that it continues to, to produce good, uh, viable um, results that we have confidence in. Um, but yes, we, we, we model system components um, in order to evaluate travel demand and ultimately um, air quality um, or pollutant emissions. So the, there, my last question, I get off my soapbox. Um, mm -hmm. They had to do with, uh, it could be TOD or it could be just uh, affordable housing or workforce housing. So is there a thought as we go from the regional transportation plan to TIPS, we get down to subregions of to give uh, cities uh, a, a premium, I don't know what word I want to use, if they're working on projects for affordable housing. So what your, your transportation projects is going to get more uh, points because you are working on workforce housing or affordable housing. Or is, is there a way you're trying to figure that out and that line item that uh, Director White put in there said still being worked? It's, a, it's an excellent question. It's one of the things that um, we are, we're thinking about and having conversations with CDOT and the other stakeholders around is what does, what does consider land use in Senate Bill 260? What does that mean in the context of this rule? What does that mean in the context of uh, preparing our federally required regional transportation plan um, and, um, and, and making TIP decisions. And quite frankly, we don't know yet. Um, and we don't know how to, we don't know how to incorporate that in, um, we, we, but it's a very important issue. And um, I think just to harken back to that list of issues that we're considering, um, kind of the stage at which the rule applies and how, is, is, is sort of related to that, Director Dale, and, and how important that is. Um, and because I think our, our technical staff at Dr. Cog feels pretty strongly that doing a, a very specific, precise greenhouse gas emission analysis of individual projects is not feasible, um, nor particularly useful in the context of a TIP. Uh, and putting together a TIP and making TIP selections. But there, there are opportunities to consider at a, at a different scale, um, the potential air quality and greenhouse gas emissions impacts of investments so that that's a consideration and a criteria for making those investment decisions. But again, there are lots of things that we're required to consider um, under federal law and federal regulation uh, when we are selecting TIP projects from the regional transportation plan. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that at least our input, our thought process to date has been that this rule ought to primarily apply to our long-range regional transportation plan and stages within that plan when we're identifying investment priorities. And as we're selecting specific projects through the TIP process from that plan that are consistent with that plan, we do uh, sort of an assessment of potential impacts and consideration along with all of the other things that we need to consider when selecting projects for specific funding. And as long as they're consistent, we don't do a project by project evaluation, we do a system evaluation once we've selected, pro proposed to select projects from the TIP. Again, with the funds that Dr. Cog controls and just to, just to highlight a point, remember that the funds that Dr. Cog directly controls through the TIP process is a fraction of all of the funds that get invested in the transportation system um, every year in, in this region. 
And we in the cities understand that because we have so many miles. But I would just think that affordable housing, the workforce housing is an equity issue and I'll be quiet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. I apologize if I'm taking people out of original order when the screen sharing stopped, I think things got shuffled. So I'm taking them as they are right now. And so next up, I have Director Coombs. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Flynn, and also to the staff for, well, staff and uh, Director White for your presentations. I guess I have a little bit of a follow-up on the question from Director Dale um, on that land use component. Like, is it that we cannot consider housing and land use in the TIP process or that we should not because it's not going to make the difference in the way that we need it to? Yeah, um, Director Coombs, thank you. Um, Thank you for the, the opportunity to clarify. <clears throat> Certainly was not suggesting that land use couldn't be considered in sort of making investment decisions. Um, and and I, I, as a as a professional in transportation planning, I there is a linkage between sort of how you invest in transportation and land use outcomes and a very strong relationship between land use decisions and transportation outcomes. And so those things are tied. What I was suggesting is that as an agency, Dr. Cog has no authority, direct authority over local land use decisions. Uh, that, that is the direct purview of local jurisdictions under Colorado state law uh, and, and has been a longstanding, um, uh, longstanding uh, uh, concept for, for Colorado um, and, and that land use structure. Um, as, I, as I indicated, one of the questions we're considering though is how can we consider land use, um, particularly because Senate Bill 260 now directs in, that, in those procedures and those policies and those guidelines that CDOT has to establish that there be one of the minimum requirements is that we have to consider land use. So we don't control land use, but how should we consider land use? And I think that's one of the things we will have to wrestle through both in the context of this rulemaking and ultimately as you all work with us to develop the next TIP policy to guide the next TIP process, how we should or can uh, appropriately consider land use in investment decisions through the TIP. Great, um, and I do have just, sorry, a little bit of follow up on that and another question. Um, so we could, for example, incentivize, we can't, Dr. Cog can't control land use decisions, but could incentivize certain types of land use decisions um, in that process and that and maybe CDOT as well. And that's part of how land use gets considered. So that's part one. And part two is if the rules come down saying you have to consider land use, um, would that create a mandate to reconsider our current TIP process that were that we've just approved would we need to make changes to be inclusive of that potential incentive or other um, land use related aspects yeah director director Coombs um, I, I would I would suggest to you that um, the rule probably ought not to be retroactive to our current tip, which covers the years um, 20 now 22 through 25, but really it was the fiscal year 2020 through 23, that four year period that we actually allocated funds to projects for as part of that last tip process. Um, and it would be extremely difficult to go back and revisit those funding commitments to those projects. Um, what I would suggest at least a recommendation would be that as we consider implementing this rule and thinking about how we consider land use in the in, in a tip cycle, that it would apply to the next tip cycle, which will cover cover the federal fiscal years 24 through 27, so that it's a proactive approach to the to the next set of investment priorities. Okay, I guess my only concern with that, although I understand not changing decisions we've made, is that. That means we lose 22 and 23 in terms of our ability to um, to be working toward these goals through the TIP process. Um, and then because I don't wanna have to go back again, I'll just ask my last question, which is 
whether or not we can look at things like road diets and bus rapid transit and how those might also have a relationship to land use. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for that last mention, um, Director Coombs, because um, those, those were both very important investment priorities established in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan that was just adopted um, just a, a couple of short months ago. Um, that, that, you know, Dr. Cog established a priority for investing in bus, bus rapid transit corridors around the region um, and um, safe street and, and, and sort of arterial retrofit types of projects to both improve safety and to provide meaningful travel options for people in those corridors to help, again, support, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the word better, different land use patterns that might be a little bit more travel efficient, if you will, that might be able to support adjacent transit service better, take advantage of investments in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, so those are definitely investment priorities as established in the RTP. And we'll have a conversation with you all about the tip, the tip policy for the next tip cycle about how we, how we bring those those priorities forward in this next tip cycle and emphasize those types of in those types of investments through the next through the next tip uh, director white did you have something to add to this uh, is that why you raised your hand i, I do um thank you chair i i just wanted to, to note um i appreciate this exchange uh, land use is probably the absolute hardest issue um just to be very clear though this this rule that's being contemplated i don't think it even says the word land use so there's nothing um in the in this rulemaking that would point cdot or mpos in one particular direction or another it's to set a goal and then it's up to all all of us to figure out the the tools and abilities we have within our within our agencies to determine how to get there so i just wanted to make sure that was clear okay thank you uh, Director Coombs, uh, was that all you had for now? Thank you. Uh, Director Teal, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess my comment would be a request that we, um, when we do talk about land use, and thank you, Director White, for your clarification on the CDOT side, but obviously uh, land use in our TIP planning, land use in our RTP um, planning uh, has been something that's been around for a while. Um, I think of Chair Stoltzman, you know, Director Dyack, uh, those of us that have been on the board for um, a half a decade or more, we know this has been a conversation we've been talking about. Here in Douglas County, we're, we're sort of in a, in a weird situation in that we've got a lot of land planning that we're held captive to from the 1980s. And we could do some modifications during the land use process, but really by and large, um, the, the transportation uh, matrix we're dealing with right now is largely shaped by land use decisions made um, 30, 40 years ago. So when we talk about integrating land use into the TIP process, our RTP process, I would like us to consider um, um, a, a couple of steps to help uh, communities like ours Namely, um, we saw in the definition presented by Director White of uh, that the incentivizing of land use is to bring housing to jobs. And I think we, we often think of it much like Jim Dale mentioned a minute ago of bringing in new housing to where jobs are. Um, but we've had programs here in Castle Rock with my six years on the Castle Rock Council, as well as here in the county where we talk about bringing primary employment into the county, namely bringing those jobs to where there are rooftops. So Ron, I wonder if part, we could have uh, uh, an analysis, uh, part of our analysis, part of our uh, moving forward in order to modify our processes here in Dr. Cog, a consideration of what effect could there be um, a credit, an acknowledgement of the individual jurisdictions programs in order to um, bring jobs into a community that already has the population, already has the housing. And then of course, the thing that we I've never heard talked about that 
uh, I really kind of had an aha moment about a, a couple of weeks ago is, you know, when we talk land use, um, one of the things we never talk about is the fact that there's a flip side to land use, that if uh, we wish to modify land use in order to lower density, in order to lower um, what has been uh, granted um, a, a landowner in terms of development, well, Colorado law allows it, it's just called a taking. And so if a community makes the decision that no, they're gonna crack down on the development and they're gonna have the number of housing units that are going in, well, that's fine under Colorado law. It's just that that, the, that property owner must be compensated. So if we do have jurisdictions that do take that hard role in order to um, actually limit land use and do undertake that investment, well, that's an investment that instead of going to a landowner could be going into the transportation network. Should there not be consideration to a credit being given when considering projects, when considering projects for uh, uh, transportation projects on the tip or uh, in terms of our RTP strategy. So Ron, I wonder if that's something that could be integrated into our analysis as we move through this process. We go from the CDOT rulemaking into our own uh, over the course of, uh, well, the timeline that was outlined earlier. Um, Director Teal, certainly we, we, did some, we did some good work around the development of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan around different scenarios. Um, it was not just that kind of our, our land use, our two land use scenarios weren't just about housing. It was, it was about sort of how land use developed. I think you make a very good point about sort of there are, um, there are existing land use decisions that are in place that are sort of, you know, they're, they are granted um, uh, uh, development um, allowances on, on properties that, that have, have been made over time. And, you know, a lot of some of that, some of that is fixed, not, not all of it, certainly. Um, I, I think I take your point um, about, you know, I think it is a very challenging question for us about how we would consider land use in the next TIP policy. And I look forward to sort of the conversations with the board around that particular issue as part of development of the, of the TIP policy for the, for the next TIP cycle. It's a really important consideration. Yeah, again, if, you know, it's just something, particularly when we talk about takings, we talk about, and it's something always implied, but never actually spoken. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if we could have some guidance, if we could have some analysis done um, by the Dr. Cog staff on what that could look like, what that would mean. Um, because otherwise I hear a lot of people talking really tough about a lot of stuff. Well, then let's talk about what Colorado law actually allows versus doesn't allow and um, start seeing if we can build a framework work so that it can be realistic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time. Well, thank you, Director Teal, very good. Uh, Director Williams, you're up, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two brief comments here, um, you know, kind of looking at, at the anticipated uh, reductions from the different categories on here. Um, clearly, EVs and EV infrastructure, uh, that is a big uh, vehicle for major reductions here, but do want to really stress opportunity around kind of multimodal implementation uh, on there. Uh, again, EVs, great opportunity on there. I think from an equity standpoint, you know, those investments in multimodal will, um, will do more to bridge some of those equity gaps in there and really hope we're able to, to focus on that. Uh, as we go through go through this process. And second comment is, you know, and I think we've heard it here today, I, I think solutions that maybe work for one municipality don't necessarily work for another and, and, and vice versa on there. And I do see this as a potential opportunity. We talked last time about some of the feedback from the dual model uh, tip process um, for some further coordination between subregions, where maybe solutions that aren't as appropriate for one, there can be um, kind of some coordination integration between the two, where someone else is able to uh, implement things that that help us achieve that budget. So, would love for us to kind of look at that opportunity as we go through uh, this rulemaking and then adjustments to the tip policy. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Director Williams. Uh, Director Brockett, you are next. 
Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll agree with uh, Director Williams on the importance of uh, multimodal um, in, in the shaping this and the equity considerations and such as part of the ways to meet our goals. Um, and also the, the land use piece of it. I think you were just talking a little earlier about how in the scenario modeling, it was often the land use choices that had the biggest outcomes on the greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, it's a thorny issue for us to tackle since we don't have direct jurisdiction over it. Um, but I look forward to some creative thinking about how we could incorporate those ideas in there. And um, Director Teal, just to, to your point about takings, you know, some of the way that land use changes could go would be to allow additional housing, say, on a transit corridor. Right? So it's not necessarily saying we you can't build something there, but in fact, you, we would rather that you build more in a certain place that's really well served by transit and has services and such and walking distance and, and things like that. Um, and then just um, a question here. So I, I see in the... Um, in the schedule that, that we, are, we are being uh, told by the legislature that we need to incorporate uh, this into the RTP in 2022, uh, or there will be consequences. So how do we have a sense yet of what that might look like? Like, how are we going to evaluate the RTP you know, for compliance with, with these plans? I know you've talked a little bit about that, but I wonder if you could describe a little bit more what that process might look like to revise the RTP in the next year. Yeah, Director Brockett, thank you. Um, we were we were fortunately planning on doing um, sort of an RTP amendment cycle next year, anyways. Um, so that that fits with the timing. I think we we uh, we believe we can we can meet the October first deadline or very close to it to the point where it won't have um, an impact in terms of that particular um, requirement of uh, Section fifty one. Your larger question is about how and. You know, we won't know the answer to that specifically until this rule is proposed and, and at least close to being adopted, if not adopted, to know sort of what our target is for Dr. Cog to aim for. And then we'll have to do some, we'll, I'll lay this out, we'll, we'll do an analysis of our existing regional transportation plan in comparison to the targets established in the rule, and we'll at least have a sense of where we are. And then we'll go through some process about trying to figure out, okay, if we need to make adjustments, um, then we'll develop a process to try to go through that with, with all of you, all of our member governments and all of our partner agencies, um, including particularly CDOT and RTD, about then any adjustments we may need to make to the RTP to, um, to comply with, with this rule. Okay, thanks for that. It would be a really interesting process uh, to how that revision will work and then to see how it then translates to the uh, the TIP funding cycle that'll begin shortly uh, in that similar time frame. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Brockett. Uh, Director Mulvey, you are up. Go ahead. Hi, yes, from Castle Pines. Um, we're in a jurisdiction that has quite a bit of development, and um, I think there are other jurisdictions like that north of Denver, east of Denver, mainly out, you know, east of 470, you know, Fort Collins area, um, a lot of areas north of Broomfield, etc. A lot of us are trying to make those the decisions about things we're doing to prevent additional miles traveled. We don't have the metrics of what it will be to say what it will be reduced to. So when considering the changes that in the rulemaking, I would ask CDOT to consider, and then also this board and staff to consider the fact that, you know, you might not have metrics from which you can operate to get that Delta. You're, you may have to be looking at what you're looking to prevent, what you're looking, you know, and isn't it always better to be on the side of prevention than to wait for a problem to occur? And so when we're talking about adding these metrics, I think we should really value communities that are all over our region, let's be honest, every single region around the metro area, and I for left out Sterling Ranch, that's a big one, you know, all of us are trying to make those decisions ahead of time. Let's reward ourselves for that when we're doing it and, and consider that when we're doing the rulemaking. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is when we're talking about um, whatever rulemaking might require additional metrics and studies, 
whether it be for EV infrastructure or reduction of greenhouse gases, whatever the case may be, you may have a lot of your jurisdictions that have smaller budgets and are already having trouble reaching your match levels. And so isn't the point of part of this organization to give funds to those um, municipalities that don't already have them? Now, some people might say some communities are more well off, et cetera, whatever the case may be. That's not really the point. When you're looking to achieve a result like a greater environmental impact, you don't want to make it harder when people are trying to get the money in the first hand. And you don't always know all these people from other places don't always know why your budget is so small or why you don't have the money to do what you have to do. And so when we're making rules, maybe we should consider how the um, and how the application or the compliance with the new rules is going to impact that jurisdiction's ability to meet that compliance. Is it going to cost us more to get those studies to, you know, understand and figure out how we're going to be reducing VMT 10 years down the road when we don't have the growth? It's going to cost us a whole lot more to figure that out than other people. So if we can build those concepts in, whether it be through reduced matches, which are impossible when we're not, when it's not our funds, or somehow in the consideration, I really appreciate it. And then also um, to piggyback and comment upon um, Director Commissioner Teals, as well as um, Director Commissioner Brockett, those um, issues of how we change zoning. Um, are really significant. If you're going to change zoning along an area by just saying, well, we can and can do something, let's think about the impacts. So for example, when Director Brockett suggested a great idea, why not just add affordable housing along a transit corridor? Well, what if you've reserved that area for open space? Isn't that a viable and important environmental concern? What if you've already reserve that for wildlife mitigation. Isn't that also an important environmental concern? So I think those are, you have to think bigger picture and what are the impacts down the road before we start saying, well, you can just this and you can just that. So thank you for listening to those comments. Certainly. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Levy, you're up. Yeah, thanks. Um, let me lower my hand first. Um, I think a, a lot of the points I wanted to make or the questions I had have, have already been asked, but I I wanted to um, you know, just, I guess, support and reinforce the comments of Director Williams and I think Director Brackett on the importance of really looking at transit and multimodal options here. Um, because we do, you know, get get a double whammy out of that. Um, we we get reductions in vehicle miles traveled and a corresponding reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But we also do make some progress towards this equity piece of who who has mobility and who does not. And and um, and, and so I think we we ought to be thinking as much as possible about how to invest in not only multimodal itself, but the kinds of improvements that really support multimodal options. Um, I'm, I'm interested, I think, in understanding more um, about what Director, or, yeah, Director White said and what's been in a lot of the materials that we've already seen about the uh, 1.5 million metric tons a reduction being the upper limit of what we can achieve through uh, through transportation planning, and you know what what goes into that, and what concerns me I, is, um, and sometimes when you you identify an upper limit like that, that becomes the ceiling, and um, and I think we need to actually be more bold. In what we're trying to um, what we're trying to accomplish through this process, and and that slide, I thought it was really interesting. I'd love. I don't think we have those materials, and I'd love to see it of the, the different 
um, areas from which we're going to achieve these greenhouse gas uh, reductions and um, you know the, the what's left over after the EV um, uh, and, and the fleet replacement um, you know where within there are we really going to get the most bang for our buck and um, you know, we've seen a dip in transit here with COVID. We don't really know how that's going to rebound, but I think we just need to be supporting that as much as possible. And I think we also ought to think in terms of a larger reduction coming through this transportation planning process. I think the last thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, the thing that we've all identified as being maybe the toughest nut to crack, which is the connection between land use planning and transportation. And how do we do that? And um, I want to, I, I just would encourage us to be very careful about seeing um, economic development proposals that attract major employers um, as, um, you know, how we model that and how we account for that in the transportation uh, in our process, because just as that could bring jobs closer to housing, it could also just foster growth that might not otherwise occur. Um, and, or it could move existing jobs from one area to another and people are just gonna get on the road and drive to the job that used to be closer to them. Um, I think what's, what we know works, um, and um, we've seen this in city of Boulder and Boulder County, is compact development. Yes, we want jobs and housing close together, but putting jobs and housing close together doesn't always mean that the people in the houses work at the jobs. <laughs> but what compact development does is make it much more economical to serve that area with transit because you get the critical mass of people who can then get on transit and it makes it much less, you, you know, you drive a whole lot less to take care of your daily needs when things are compact. And so I think we need to think um, not just in terms of proximity of jobs and housing, which is really important, but also just in terms of um, the extent to which we um, support by our transportation investments, sprawling development. Um, I guess the, the last thing I would say right now, and, and I know that we'll have to look into this in a lot more detail uh, as, as things go along, is that to Director Teal's concern, and I think Director Mulvey's as well about takings, um, you know, generally what what is, I, I think what all of this leads to is, is actually a greater value for people's property. Uh, we're talking about allowing more intensive use than, than uh, existing zoning might otherwise uh, allow. And in all the areas in which you see transit-oriented development and more compact development and you see transit come in, what you see is a tremendous increase in property values. So I, um, I think, you know, yes, we can preserve open space. We can value wildlife corridors and those things and all of that really supports compact development. And I think it'll uh, lead to uh, much more um, greater increases in property values. So um, I think those are just the comments I would make right now. Thank, thank you, Director Levy. Uh, Director Stolzman, uh, before you start actually, uh, I want to let folks know that uh, performance and engagement is supposed to start at 5:30, and they have some very important uh, items on their agenda to discuss. And but I and I we have the complete streets presentation after this, which I would really like to get in. We can do that in 10 or 15 minutes. So if uh, I haven't checked with Steve Conklin, yet, uh, Director Conklin yet, uh, but if it's possible that we could push back the start of PE to about 5:45, uh, this is a very good discussion to be having. Uh, but I want to be able to fit in Jacob's uh, presentation as well before we start, uh, just to let you all know. Uh, go ahead, Director Solzman. Director Conklin looked like he was going to respond to you, so I just... No, I, I was just going to say I, I support that. I think that's very important for us to, to get that in tonight, so thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I really feel good that it sounds like there's a lot of agreement around that there is a problem. And that makes me feel really good that we can all agree there is a problem that we want to collectively tackle. And 
this, in my opinion, is the problem of our generation. This is the biggest issue that we need to be working on. Um, and I then have to go to what I'm disappointed by, and that's that it doesn't look like we're on track to meet our 2025 targets as set out in the greenhouse gas roadmap. It doesn't look like we're on target to reach our 2030 targets in the greenhouse gas roadmap. And I agree with Director Levy that it would be really helpful to understand that 1.7 million metric tons better that's now being called an upper limit. The numbers I've seen, that to me looks like an unrealistic scenario. And, I, and it's not that I don't want to achieve it. I want to go, I want to blow far past that. We need to do much better than that. But putting in a model, unrealistic assumptions that we can't fund, that there's no way of doing like doubling transit in that period. I looked through, I don't think um, Bill Van Meter's on today. He, I hope he's on vacation. He's been working really hard, but it, it, right now our transit is half of what it was in 2019. And that's not built into that 1.7 million metric ton number. And it shows a 6% growth a year. And we can't even get RTD to restore our, um, our fast track service that they've cut. So it, you know, I, I'm not trying to be against the idea that we should have a rule and that we should reduce emissions. It's that we need to take this really seriously to get the kinds of results we need. So um, I would like to ask that when we talk about this again, we can understand that 1.7 million metric tons better. Um, and understand each item that was changed from the base case in there, bulleted out, and how much we think carbon emissions can be reduced by each of those strategies, and an estimated cost associated with each strategy. And so, so some people are more, um, you know, they, they think more conceptually, and, and these stories and ideas re resonate more with them, but I'm much more of a data person, so I really need that level of analysis to understand what we're talking about. Um, and then it would also be, I've heard a lot about uh, multimodal, multimodal, multimodal. We have the ability today to require 100% of our TIP to be multimodal. So if the outcome of this is that we want a bigger share of TIP dollars to go to multimodal projects, we can just set that as a policy of the board. We don't have to model projects and go through all of this additional work. If that's what we want, because it addresses equity and it addresses these other things, we can just set that policy. So I guess I think having a model scenario run that shows 100% of our tip going to multimodal would be useful because I think you'll be disappointed with what that does in terms of million metric tons of carbon emissions reduced. Now, don't get me wrong, it reduces VMT. It, it helps an equity issue. It might be the most cost-effective way of serving our region with different services, and there's a lot of good reasons to do it. But that doesn't mean that it's going to tackle this carbon emissions existential crisis that we're facing. And so I think we need to get a little bit real about that. And um, I, I, I'm glad we're having some of these conversations about land use, but I think people are trying to be a little bit sensitive of each other's emotional <laughs> state. And so it, it's hard because, right, like maybe the answer is that building and transportation resources should go to the city of Denver and not the city of Louisville. And that might be the right thing to do from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint. And the city of Louisville might not like that, right? Because maybe I have plans for the future of my city or something, but that might be the answer. And when we talked about urban growth boundary, these conversations weren't easy. So when people are screwing around the issue and saying, no, no, it means you can have more. It doesn't mean you can have more everywhere. It means you can have more in some places and you intentionally have to have less in others. And so that's why it's a really hard conversation because if it is a zero sum game and one person gets more and that's perceived as good and one person gets less and that's perceived as bad, it's really hard. But maybe if we could change the conversation that instead of seeing like, instead of looking at it as Denver and Louisville, if we can say, oh, it's the region and the whole region is still netting the same amount and we're just doing it in a better way, if we could, if we could recognize that as a regional win, and feel successful about that, I, I think we could have some good outcomes, but it doesn't mean the conversations will be easy. Um, and it doesn't mean that we'll be able to get consensus. So I, I think that's important. And then last, I think we need to actually, and I proposed this before, expand our purview, expand the conversation to be able to blow past that 1.7 million metric ton number. So, um, Counties that you wouldn't even expect have sent me letters since, since I last spoke at the meeting about, hey, what if we um, market, what, what if we make carbon cost? And you say, whoa, this county commissioner is sending me that? <clears throat> what if we do a social cost of carbon and assign it to emissions and really monetize the cost of this? How, how would that work? How would that change 
driving behavior? What if we looked at different scenarios? So I really do think there's a lot of agreement that there's a problem. And I think we need to do more to look at the magnitude of the problem and the potential solutions that exist to us in order to be able to tackle the magnitude of the problem that we have. Um, and I just have one other uh, thing that would be helpful from a data standpoint. Sorry, I was trying to go in order and I missed this one. And that is, you know, that graphic that uh, Director White showed us today is really useful. But the thing that's not clear to me is if growth is built into that. So for example, air travel is expected to grow su substantially in the next decade. So while we're, we'll make this improvement, perhaps if we do, if we can all work together and get it done in some segments, is that gonna be blown out of the water by the growth in emissions in other segments? And then what are we gonna do about that? So um, that would be useful information to understand next time we talk as well. And I thank you all. I think this has been a great discussion. Thank you, yes it has. Uh, Director Wheelock, you are up, go ahead. Uh, you're still muted. Yeah, at the risk of saying sure. something that uh, uh, hasn't already been said, uh, I'll take that risk. Uh, I, I would I'd like to say that I think that a lot of the problem lies in our language. I, there was something I said in another meeting a while back, which is, you know, we talk about multimodality versus electrification versus land use versus the scale. And in each case, we use one of those as a reason, almost like Frau Blucher and young Frankenstein to react to it. And, and I think the truth is that if we, um, if we wait to do something until we can do everything, we won't ever do anything uh, because everything is always changing. The, the, the scale is always changing. But we know that, that we do have a region here that we need to deal with and it's called Earth. And that's what's driving us to have this discussion about greenhouse gas rules. You can't solve global warming in Louisville or Boulder or Denver or, or Clear Creek County. And so I think it's uh, really important that we look at all of the solutions and we not consider any of them to be precluding others. We have a lot of environmental concerns, I agree. Open space is an important thing, but we know we're working on open space everywhere. We know that Ford, Tesla, and a number of other people are all vying for the electric market. So we know we're going to be electrifying more and more automobiles, and we know we're going to be putting that infrastructure in. We should continue to incentivize and do that. But the reality is multimodality has become the Frau Blucher word. It's the word that we really have been afraid of the most because so many places think it doesn't apply to them in rural areas or we're concerned that it will take away from something else. Multimodality is a continually changing concept and we're adding the pieces to it all of the time. And I think it is really gonna be the secret. It's about behavior. It's about how we move ourselves and it's about how we do get out of you know, single occupancy vehicles and into all kinds of different ways of moving ourselves with and without you know, with and without energy, whether we're talking, you know, some people think it means only a bike path and other people think it means only a train and other people thinks, think it means only a bus. And we're adding to the list all the time. And I think that multimodality is a really huge thing to stay with. But we shouldn't be afraid of it. I think it's probably the single biggest thing that we're facing. In land use, we're gonna to have to get out of our silos and recognize that counties control land use and, you know, and, and, trans, and CDOT, controls transportation and road and bridge controls transportation, but we really are in one place. And these silos have to be broken down with windows through which we incentivize and provide the carrot for the right kind of multi-use land use decisions that will allow us to move forward. We've been talking about transit oriented design for many, 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 many years. It's obviously a solution without which the rest of the stuff doesn't work. So I don't know if I added anything to the conversation uh, so hopefully I, I didn't scare anyone by saying anything that hadn't already been said. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And Executive Director Rex, could you research through Dr. Cogminitz, find out if this is actually the first Mel Brooks reference we've ever had at a meeting? Uh, I'm Director on it. Ha <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Howard, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm an alternate um, new to uh -huh. this, but I, I just had one comment I wanted to add. First, Director Wheelock, um, Mayor Stoltzman, thank you for your comments. I could not agree more. I think they're absolutely spot on. Um, and the perspective I wanna bring is working with um, boards in private companies that are looking at these existential challenges and trying to make some drastic changes. And at the end of the day, 
you can't deal with it incrementally. And the only way to make it happen is to change the way you're thinking about funding. So I would suggest as you look at your new TIP process and, and as you go forward, put, push everything off the table and start from scratch. And if this is truly believed to be the existential threat, which many of us do believe, then it has to be front and center to every funding decision you make. And if, and if it's part of every single funding decision, every single prioritization, that will change behavior. And anything short of that probably won't. So that's my comment. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, appreciate it. I uh, uh, just wanna close the discussion by reminding everyone that this will be on a very short uh, time frame. So please consult with your staff and please consult with your colleagues if you have to represent your, your community and make sure you're in sync with them when we meet on the 18th. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, Jacob has indicated that he can do the complete streets uh, presentation in a, a completely record amount of time. Uh, it's a very important topic. It's something I've been looking forward to for this session. And I don't wanna give it short shrift, but uh, uh, Jacob, if you can go as expeditiously as possible and then tell us where we can uh, get more information, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Director. Uh, give me just a second here. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, okay. we can, go ahead. Um, thank you for the extra time. I really appreciate it. I will be efficient. I realize for many of you, I'm standing between you and dinner and that's not a good place to be. <laughs> and um, my, anniversary, is, my anniversary dinner. That's right. So, um, but this is really important. It actually ties into the conversation you've been having this evening. So I at least want to give you the highlights and then invite you all to contact me offline uh, if you want more information. So I want to talk to you about something we're calling the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, it relates very closely both to the conversation that you've just had this evening, um, but more broadly to our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it's one of the key implementation strategies. Um, it also relates to, um, to the Regional uh, Vision Zero Action Plan uh, that we passed last year, uh, that we adopted last year, I should say. Um, really briefly, you know, just, just sort of a summary, what is this toolkit? Why is it important? You know, you all have been talking about how do we make some of these big picture conceptual things happen? How do we, you know, when, when we get to the ground on this stuff, how do we make this work? And the toolkit is really meant to do that, you know, from the notion of complete streets, making streets sort of as multimodal, um, as available, as, as um, encompassing as possible for all different types of travel um, throughout our region. So at the summary level, Toolkit will provide guidance for local governments to plan, design, and implement complete streets um, and to help ensure that multimodal elements are incorporated into transportation projects. And in saying that, I want to acknowledge that, you know, as we've talked about this evening, we have a very diverse region. Each of our communities is different. Each of our streets and our projects are different. Um, and this toolkit embraces that, that diversity and that flexibility. Uh, we understand that everyone is situated differently. Um, but I think for all of us in our unique local contexts, um, you know, that there is potential um, aspirations for what we want our streets and our transportation system to be. Um, so I'm not gonna read all this to you, um, both because you already have it and in the interest of time, but I think the point here is that this really is meant as a toolkit, like our regional Vision Zero Action Plan, um, like our uh, Active Transportation Plan, some of our recent plans, it's meant to provide data, information, resources, education, uh, information, things that you can specifically use um, to do this at the local level. Um, the function of the toolkit, you know, this is an important implementation piece of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, I'll show you in a second that part of it we actually already incorporated in the 2050 RTP. Uh, we do want to carry this forward as we get into tip time um, and really draw on that relationship um, to really incentivize and help all of you um, and CDI, you know, really bring the best projects forward, um, you know, with the limited sort of um, ultimately sort of taxpayer dollars that we have to invest in the, in the transportation improvement program. We want these projects to be the very best projects they can be. Um, that's part of what the toolkit is, is aimed to help us do um, collectively as a region. Um, one of the big important components of the toolkit is something called street typology. Um, let me just kind of go through here so just so you can see all of this. Um, the typology is really meant to sort of talk about, to characterize types of streets within our region. Um, it's, it's related to, but it's different from functional classification. 
not meant to replace, you know, sort of individual local government functional classification, but it is meant to, you know, sort of talk about, you know, for certain types of streets, you know, how could these streets sort of be designed? How could they function? And not just where they're at today, but sort of aspirationally over time, you know, what is our vision for different types of streets um, in this region? Um, so through this complete streets toolkit process, we've identified really 10, um, along with limited access highways, but really 10 different types of street typologies, again, recognizing um, the diversity of our region, you know, urban areas like downtown Denver, all the way to our mountain communities uh, with our mountain roads and everything in between. Um, we created a, we worked with our steering committee and with our local governments to um, all of you um, to create this and sort of define the street typologies and create a map um, that shows the location of these different types of streets or these typologies across the region. Um, and as I said, we integrated this. This was so important. This was one of the first things that we did as part of the Complete Streets Toolkit. And we integrated this already. It's in chapter two of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it works hand in hand with our regional roadway system uh, for those who recognize that term, which is really just our planning network um, of streets and roadways within um, our regional transportation plan and what we use uh, primarily for funding decisions within the transportation improvement uh, program and for regional air quality conformity. So these are meant to kind of work together as we move forward from plan time um, into implementation time through the transportation improvement program. As we're putting the larger toolkit together, uh, we're giving very sort of detailed guidance, specific guidance around for each of these street typologies. You know, what could they look like? Again, this isn't directive per se, um, but it's meant to be, look, if you, if you want that information around how do I design a neighborhood street, you know, how do I design a, a particular type of, of street typology, you know, it will give that very specific guidance. How do we, how do we juggle all the different modes upon this different street type? What's the design guidance? So a lot of graphics, a lot of tables, a lot of things, again, from that toolkit perspective uh, to really be helpful in terms of street design and project design within the toolkit. Um, other things that the toolkit will include, um, as you see, design element guidance for multiple categories. I won't read all those, uh, but you can see them on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, an example of what it's going to look like within the document. Um, so again, if you have a particular type of street and you're interested in, well, how do I, what's the best way to accommodate pedestrians and how do I, you know, how do I juggle that against the other modes that the street is meant to convey? Um, this will give you specific design guidance to help you do that. Um, so that's really it. That's again, sort of drinking from the fire hydrant. Um, what I'd close with is that we're intending to go pretty soon um, to a 30 day public comment period. Uh, we've been working with our steering committee to um, kind of refine and, and finalize the draft uh, Complete Streets Toolkit. Uh, then we'll have that out for again, a 30 day uh, review period uh, where everyone will once again have a chance to, uh, to kind of look through it and provide their comments. And then we'll bring it back to you this fall uh, for your approval or adoption of the final uh, Complete Streets Toolkit. So let me end both by saying thank you for the time tonight to bring this to your attention, uh, but to all of you who worked with us through uh, development of the draft toolkit. Um, it's a better document because of collective efforts, and I hope you'll see that uh, when the draft document comes out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, uh, the remind directors that there is uh, uh, so a, a bit more detail in the packet uh, for in the staff memo, and please read that. Um, from my standpoint, I think this can be transformational, whether you're in, uh, no matter what community you're in. Uh, if uh, folks haven't had a chance to do this yet, the 39th, the Denver 39th Avenue Greenway uh, is, a, is a project that I think, uh, if you're ever along, uh, uh, where is it at? It's uh, in the Cole neighborhood around uh, from Williams to Franklin. It's part of the, uh, uh, the drainage uh, project that we've been doing uh, to, that accompanies the uh, Central 70 project. 39th Avenue has been turned into a complete and shared street system uh, along with the, uh, uh, the drainage way that goes through there. And it's, it's quite interesting. I do find, however, that uh, sometimes when we know this is the direction we're going, that when a party comes in with a project proposal that calls for a complete street uh, or shared street, that staff reviewers tend to revert to the rule book and say, you can't do that. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, th this toolkit provides a pathway to, uh, uh, to finally adopt some of these uh, uh, designs that really need to happen. Uh, so thank you, Jacob. Do any directors have comments or questions for Jacob? And 
okay, it doesn't look like it. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the product of this, Jacob, thank you. With that, uh, I don't see any other business than the, uh, let me go back to my agenda, and that is the last agenda item. So uh, the next item is actually adjournment, but uh, many of us are on uh, performance and engagement committee and we will log into that. Uh, Melinda, does that take like, uh, we need to give maybe four or five minutes, uh, 545. So yeah, this is Doug. I, I would suggest that we go ahead and keep the 545 time that we, we, we okay. suggested, give people a chance. Okay, just go, go to the link and log in at 545. And Mr. Chairman, that, yes. just one more thing. I wanted to answer your question, your Mel Brooks question. Our crack staff was able to find 15 years ago, we did have a Mel Brooks uh, reference. <laughs> right? It was a Mel Brooks scene from Blazing Saddles. So just so you know, it was in relation to a, t a toll discussion that we were having. Impressive. <laughs> Somebody's have to go back and get a bunch of dimes. <laughs> That was Steve Cook, our local historian, that came up with that. Oh, my God, Steve. <laughs> That's good to know. I'm, I'm glad to know that I did not say anything that hadn't been said before. Thank God. <laughs> Boom. That's all I got to say to that. Go <laughs> Thank right. you. Uh, with that, on that note, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Bye, everybody.